Good morning, everyone. Uh, Young Anderson is uh, pleased to once again be the sponsor for uh, this year's PIBC conference. And on behalf of uh, all of the members of the firm, uh, I'd uh, like to welcome uh, as our keynote speaker, Jesse Hemphill to uh, uh, give us our, a keynote address this morning. Jesse Hemphill is a Kwakwakwakwak person and Métis person from the North Island, from North Vancouver Island. Her planning career began with her home community Guasala Nakwakwo uh, nations um, in 2008. And since then, she's traveled across Canada working with Indigenous communities and organizations and all levels of government on Indigenous planning matters. She was elected to Council of the District of Port Hardy in 2011 and again in 2014. Uh, she was appointed to the Board of Directors of the Kawatsi Economic Development Corporation for several years and founded Elder Hill Planning Incorporated in, in 2016. She has a Master of Community Planning from Vancouver Island University, where she was awarded the Governor General's Gold Medal and has been a recipient of uh, CIP President's Award for Young Planners in 2018. In addition to her current role as Senior Planner with Elder Hill, she teaches Indigenous Planning at UBC and uh, Vancouver Island University. And she lives in Sinaimic territory with her husband, Jemaine, and daughter, Ida. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jesse Hemphill. Mm -hmm. I'm Jesse Hempel. Thank you so much, Bill, for that, that lovely introduction. Um, I come from, as you said, the Guasla Nakoro Nations. I live here in Nanaimo. And uh, when I got the invitation to join you today to speak at this conference of peers and colleagues, I was very honored and very excited. Uh, my original plan when I first got the invite, you know, a few weeks ago, a month ago, was to focus on Indigenous futurism and visionary Indigenous planning. This is my jam, my favorite thing to talk about. Um, there are so many incredible projects happening, so many incredible things happening in Indigenous communities. Um, and I wanted to bring you a vision of what the future could look like with Indigenous planning at the forefront. Um, but then at the end of May, the story came out that's already been mentioned this morning out of Tecumlux to Kiswetmuk uh, territory about the Indian residential school and the graves that were there. The unmarked graves of children as young as three years old. Uh, I have a nephew, Aliwas, who is three years old. He turned three last week. And my daughter, Ida, is two years old. You might hear her in the background because she loves to come visit mama during work time. And so over the last few weeks, the thought of what happened to those 215 children, and now, you know, we know the numbers are up to, I think, close to 600 with the other stories from other schools across Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and now Pennsylvania. And so uh, the stories have been pouring out of our people as these um, graves are found and, and coming out in the news. And so I've spent many, many nights awake over the last few weeks thinking about these stories, thinking about our history. And uh, it felt imperative to show up today to uh, honor that, to acknowledge where we are right now um, and do a little bit more sort of remembering and reckoning with the past, um, bringing it into a planning context. There's a, a lovely quote from my friend and colleague, Leonie Sandercock, that reminds us that Professions like nations keep their shape by molding their members or citizens understanding of the pasts, causing them to forget those events that do not accord with a righteous image while keeping alive those memories that do. Now, I know that the vast majority of you here today have kind hearts and want to do, um, do well for Indigenous folks in Canada. And I hope that by the end of our time today, we will have a sense of what that might look like. Uh, and in the meantime, let's spend a little bit of time remembering and reckoning uh, and thinking about um, the implications of our, our profession and the role that we have played. I also want to pause here to acknowledge that some of what I'll be talking about is very traumatic. Um, and so if you are 
uh, an Indigenous person, especially if your trauma cup is full today, there's no shame in stepping away and taking a breather to take care of yourself if you need that. But uh, if you have capacity, and especially if you are a settler planner, uh, I really invite you to stay with me over these next 45 minutes as we talk uh, about Indigenous planning and what uh, planning has done to Indigenous people and how we can move forward together. Uh, I have slides. I'm not going to show all of them, but there'll be a few points when I share some images with you. Oh, and there's my daughter trying to come and visit. Um, the theme of the conference this year is North of Normal, as has been mentioned by the opening uh, folks this morning. And I uh, think for many of us, this theme immediately makes us think about the topsy-turvy year and a half we've had as the COVID-19 pandemic spread globally and has fundamentally changed the way we live our lives, including the way that we take part in this conference. Um, I think also has been mentioned, you know, we've been thinking about the impacts of climate change and how normal is shifting. Um, but either of these interpretations require us to believe that life was normal before the pandemic or before sort of the worst um, symptoms of climate change that we've been experiencing lately. And, and so that's what I really wanted to focus on today. What is normal? How do we think of normal? And how have planners and others used and abused ideas of what is normal to the detriment of Indigenous folks? Um, the shape of my talk is I'm going to speak briefly to pre-contact Indigenous normal in British Columbia, focusing on my own community, Guasa Nakoro, sharing some images of, uh, of our community. I want to shift then to talking a little bit about how that normal changed after European contact. I'll share my own community story as a case study of planning, um, and I'll talk about how we're reclaiming planning for our own healing and success. And then finally, I'll wrap up talking about what we as planners, as a community of practice, and especially settler planners, can do moving forward uh, in light of what an acceptable normal should be for Indigenous folks and others in British Columbia. So I'm going to briefly share a picture here with you of uh, my community's home village. So um, uh, I come from the Guasanacoro nations, but we were historically two separate tribes, the Guasala to the north in Smith Inlet on the central coast of British Columbia, and the Nakoto further south in Seymour Inlet. And uh, you'll hear more about how we came to amalgamate later. This is a picture of the Nakoto winter village, Baas or Blendon Harbor. And uh, I love this village because when uh, I was doing my thesis for VIU, I wanted to study Indigenous urban design, thinking about how can we modernize our uh, cultural practices around urban design. And so I did interviews with elders in my community, including my uh, uncle Thomas Henderson Sr. or uh, Hitlamas, he's the hereditary chief for our nation. And when I asked him how this village came to be built, you know, how they decided where the houses would go, um, how things would be spaced out, just the overall layout. I was expecting him to say, well, you know, the most powerful chief chose the best location close to the running water, and then his family got the houses adjacent and so on and so forth. Or I thought maybe he would say, well, you know, the biggest families got uh, the site where they could build the biggest houses and then the smaller families got kind of the, the smaller areas to the outskirts. But that was not the case at all. He said um, what they did was looked at the individual families in this village and there was one family of people who were just physically small. And so every year as a seasonal cycle shifted and all the families had to pack up these beautiful big houses, taking the cedar planks off of them, putting them across canoes, piling their belongings on top and moving out to fishing, seaweed harvesting, gathering grounds, this small family would struggle because there was a lot of stuff to carry. And so they put that family's home as close to the good canoe tie-ups as possible so that they had the least distance to travel to move their stuff every cycle. And then there was another uh, household that was very elderly. Their children had moved off to other families, other places. And so it was just an elderly couple who needed a lot of support from the others around them. 
And so they took their house and sited it right in the middle of Ba'as so that everybody else walking back and forth every day would pass by the home of these elders and be able to easily check in and see if they needed firewood brought in or water packed or anything like that. And uh, actually the more sort of powerful or able, the more capacity and privilege that a family had, the further away they were from the center sort of hub of the community. And I just love this story because what it says to me is that our fundamental urban design principle was an ethic of, of care and support. Imagine, imagine what our cities and towns would feel like if planners had been able to, had been empowered to, um, design and build communities according to an ethic of, or a design principle of care and support above anything else. It's, um, I think we're making moves in that direction now, but imagine if that had been the fundamental principle from the beginning. And then not only that, but all these houses you see here were created from living materials gathered in uh, a respectful way, our people were able to take these planks off of trees and leave the tree living so that we could go back and harvest more. Like that's amazing. And centuries later, all of these buildings will turn to dirt that will nourish the next generation of trees from which we can harvest boards and build more houses. As we grapple with the impacts of climate change, imagine what it would look like to live in towns and cities where we knew that our infrastructure was capable of supporting us, supporting us to live in large, um, comfortable, thriving, growing, very urban feeling communities, but that within a couple of centuries, there would be no harmful trace left. And in fact, imagine living in communities where we were such good caretakers and stewards of the land, of the plants, as Copper Joe mentioned this morning, of all the living creatures on the land and in the waters, such good uh, stewards and partners that we left these populations healthier <laughs> than when we built our settlements. Because this is the reality. There um, was a story that recently came across my desk that uh, in Heltsuk territory, I believe, or maybe Tsimshin territory, they can still see 150 years later evidence of the food gardens that the indigenous folks in that area, the Tsimshin folks cultivated, that the biodiversity, the, the richness of the foods in those areas is still higher than surrounding areas because of the beautiful impact that people had maintaining those lands. So we would sustain them and they would sustain us. All of this to say that what was normal for my ancestors was to live in community in large multi-generational households connected to our ancestors, thinking about future generations, taking care of the land, living with slightly fewer sort of creature comforts than we do now, <clears throat> but I think living quite beautiful lives. And all of our elders that remember those days living in Ba'as will speak to the joy, the comfort, the rest, the, the fulfillment they experienced there. And their practices are still taking care of us, right? A hundred plus years later, um, their influence on the landscape is still um, has is still maintaining these landscapes that we enjoy uh, across British Columbia, Yukon Territory, and, and really anywhere Indigenous peoples have been for millennia, at least fifteen thousand years, if not longer. We would say since time immemorial. We know, of course that that normal, that feeling of what was normal for my ancestors shifted around the late 1700s here in BC and began to unravel. So with the first um, waves of contact, as we all know, came the waves of epidemics. Um, 1700s all the way through the 1800s. And the toll of these epidemics was so great across Turtle Island or North America, that it literally caused a mini ice age as indigenous populations dipped so low that our traditional land stewardship and management practices ceased to occur. The impact of that was measurable. It's measurable in the carbon records. Um, sometimes I hear the word decimation. You know, our populations were decimated, but the word decimate actually means a loss of one in 10 one in 10 people. That's like one of the worst words we can think of to describe a population loss of that magnitude. And it's only uh, one ninth of what the loss actually was. Nine out of 10 
people passed away in the space of a few decades or a century. This was the apocalypse for Indigenous folks in North America. My, um, my community members still hold grief about those losses that happened so quickly. Again, my uncle TK, when I talked to him for my thesis, I asked him about <clears throat> how these losses were marked by our communities. And he said when he was a little kid, growing up in our territories with his, with his grandfather, um, they were out one day by this river and they came across this pile of small pebbles. And he asked his grandfather what those pebbles were for. And his grandfather said that every pebble represented someone that had been lost in the epidemics as they came through that particular village. And he could pick them up and hold them in his hand and remember the names of the dozens of people that were lost from that particular village. And we have, you know, many, many villages across our territories where similar numbers were lost. And so um, when we think about the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that it's had on people, just really encourage you to remember that it is not unprecedented for Indigenous folks. We've been through much worse. And if the solution to keeping our people safe now is simply to stay home <laughs> and, um, and, and do what we can to take care of ourselves and our communities, what a gift that is to be able to move through this pandemic um, with such fewer losses than the one we were few in just a few centuries ago. So I just encourage everyone to keep that in mind. I also think that it's important for us to remember the population loss coming from the epidemics because when we think about climate change, there's a lot of fear uh, about what the future holds and a lot of fear about changing and a lot of worry about how can we be resilient in the face of these difficulties and uh, it should be maybe comforting to know that Indigenous folks survived a 90% population loss with our cultures not intact necessarily, but still alive. And I'm here today. And so if there is anyone that knows how to move through challenge, to move through difficulty with resilience and come through the other side, uh, it is Indigenous people with a lot to share about how we can do that together. After the epidemics, normal was already starting to disappear in our communities. Many amalgamations took place at that time as uh, villages, populations dropped and people needed to centralize. And so you see the whole landscape of Indigenous settlement shift just before the big waves of settlement in Canada happens, um, which is really interesting to think about when you imagine what people were seeing, what European settlers were seeing when they showed up to this land. And the idea of terra nullius, right? The idea of empty land. Um, and that just a few decades before that, there would have been so many more people out on the land. Sometimes I wonder how that could have fundamentally shifted Indigenous settler relations. But as it was, people started showing up, you know, in the 1800s in numbers. And uh, with them, they brought a new idea of what normal should be. So the new normal, according to settlers, should be white Christian capitalist with heterosexual men in charge. We sometimes call this like a Western approach, a colonial approach. There are many sort of labels. Um, but what it's speaking to is this new idea of normal, this new idea of normal that came out of an industrialized Europe. Uh, and recognizing that many of the settlers that were coming to the quote unquote new world were escaping the degradation of the land that came from industrialization and came to this land in pursuit of new resources that could be extracted for profit or new land that could be settled for agriculture, um, for, for urbanization. And so is it any wonder that, you know, a century, two centuries later, that's this is what we have. So normal, Indigenous normal was being replaced with the new colonial normal. And as the planning profession grew in this country, these ideas of what was normal were codified by the planning practices that claimed Indigenous land for white settlers and capitalist industry and expansion while overriding pre-existing Indigenous title. There's a, an excellent um, article by Blomley um, that speaks really in detail to, I think it's called the Frontier, the Survey and the Grid, talking about the literal planning instruments 
that our profession rested on um, as like very clear tools of violence and harm against indigenous people. And uh, is it any wonder that conflict arose, especially in the East where settlement happened earlier, uh, but coming later to British Columbia? In 1763, of course, the Royal Proclamation affirmed Indigenous title and cautioned settlers to respect it. Um, it cautioned settlers and, and the, the colonial governments to recognize that Indigenous folks were here first and that settlement and expansion needed to happen in an organized way led by the government. But the proclamation was largely, um, or in many cases, ignored and colonial expansion continued. And so, um, Indigenous folks were pushed into smaller and smaller areas, our normal shifted more and more rapidly. Uh, and then in the middle of the 19th century, the colonial government consolidated several different pieces of legislation and policy into something called the Indian Act, appointing itself not only ward of Indigenous land, but ward of Indigenous or Indian peoples, stripping us of our ability to self-govern and live our normal lives the way we had prior to contact. Um, the Indian Act, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about it today. Bob Joseph has an incredible book called 21 Things You Didn't Know About the Indian Act. There are many other places you can learn more about it. Um, it is, when you start to read about it, it's hard to imagine, I think, at this point in time, how a such an evil piece of legislation could have been written and made public by the government as its tool for managing a group of people. Um, and we need to recognize that careful planning and forethought went into the development of this Indian Act. There were many points where um, folks within the government said, hey, you know what, like this is pretty bad. We should make these changes. We can't, these rules are not um, helping us in our goal of assimilation. And actually they're very violent and harmful. And those suggestions were overturned time and again. And, and some of the awful parts were kept for a long, long time. You're probably familiar with the potlatch um, ban that lasted from the 1880s up to the 1950s. Like imagine not being able to practice any form of governance law or culture, because all of that is what took place in the potlatch for us. Um, of course, the reserve system, um, another very obvious example of planning in action, uh, flourished across Canada as Indians were relegated to small pieces of land um, in Indian reserves that, that still exist today. Um, we were arrested for practicing our faith in governance, banned from leaving reserves, banned from hiring legal representation, banned from mounting land claims against the government, banned from gathering in large numbers, even banned from voting, of course, until 1960. So remember that Indigenous folks or Indians, status Indians, were the last sort of group, racial group in Canada to get the right to vote in federal elections. And yet we were the very first people here long before the colonial government. The racism and oppression is very obvious in the Indian Act and in the federal government, but the provincial government was not exempt either. And in fact, the very first act of the British Columbia legislature, once British Columbia and the colony of Vancouver Island combined, the very first motion that they passed was to ban Indians from voting in provincial elections, the first order of business. And so I think sometimes those of us that work with local government think, um, that it's different, but, but these patterns of what is normal uh, have been there throughout history. So the Indian Act made normal life for Indigenous people in Canada a life of hardship, violence, and oppression. Uh, perhaps though, the most horrific way that the colonial government granted itself power was by giving itself the power to remove Indigenous children from families and communities for many reasons and without effective oversight, including, of course, the Indian residential school system. I learned that at a point in time, if you were an Indian woman on reserve and you were widowed 
your husband or your partner passed away, the Indian agent could come to your home and if they deemed you an unfit mother, they could take your child. That was enough justification um, for taking children away from their families. Like imagine being newly widowed and having someone show up at your house to take your kids away because you had been widowed. Imagine being a parent at the time of residential schools where you were legally obligated to send your kids. And especially if you were a parent who had been through that system yourself and had experienced what happened there and experienced the separation and loss. So you have the following options. You can resist sending your children to residential school and run the risk of going to jail. And maybe you never see them again. Maybe they're apprehended while you're in jail and adopted out. Or you can send your children to the schools knowing that at least you might see them once or twice a year if they come home. In some cases, parents chose to adopt out their kids preemptively, hoping that at least they could have a role in choosing the family or knowing where their child had gone. But in lots of cases, there was no choice at all. And the RCMP simply took children when they were out playing. And in some cases, kids who were too young to even speak or didn't speak English, who were too young to defend themselves or speak to their families, their connection, who were taken away to residential school without their parents even knowing at the time where they had gone. This is what happened to TK, actually, the elder that I spoke about early, earlier. He was taken when he was too young and when he was out playing in the community. And over the last few weeks, as the stories about the experiences that people, families have had with residential school have come out, I actually learned for the first time that my own great great grandmother had her eldest child taken by the Indian agent while she was potlatching and adopted out in the US, never to be reconnected with our family again. Just think about that for a moment. Every Indigenous person you know has a story, and even if they don't know what that story is because they were part of that separation, part of being adopted out, even if they don't know that story, the trauma is still there for all of us. And it's at a peak point right now. <sighs> My mom over the last few weeks has been reflecting on the sadness that she perceived among her older generations. My great-grandmother also went to residential school herself. And so we've been thinking about, you know, what has this done to our family, the pervasive sadness? And uh, I'm not gonna, you know, open up a library of family-specific horror stories, but just know that they're there. And so for all the Indigenous folks that you're talking to lately, we um, are being confronted every time we open the newspaper or look into social media with the stories of how child abuse was normalized for our ancestors, for family members, for almost 200 years in the Indian residential school system and elsewhere. The word genocide is not out of place here. There's um, a quote from Paulette Reagan's book, uh, unsettling the settler within, which is great reading if you're looking to learn a little bit more about this. And she's quoting uh, Dean New and Richard Terrian in their book, Accounting for Genocide. She says, they argue in their book that soft technologies such as strategic planning, law, accounting, which combine legal frameworks, accounting techniques and economic rationalizations with program and funding mechanisms actually constitute violence, a slow form of genocide enacted over time. And so I share this quote today to remind us again that planning is not exempt. This story is not about um, the past only. It's not about uh, key figures like Duncan Campbell Scott, who is described as the architect of the residential school system. And for uh, architects watching maybe today or folks who work with architects, um, I think we should be really concerned about how this label is being used to describe figures like Duncan Campbell Scott, who created these, these systems that harm so many people. Um, let us also remember that planning the slow form of genocide, these soft technologies are still being used to normalize 
uh, harm against Indigenous folks and especially Indigenous children. Many of you might know this, but currently there are more Indigenous kids in care of the state, so in foster homes or being adopted out, than there were at the height of the residential school system. Right now, there are more kids who've been taken out of their communities, out of their families, than there were at the height of the residential school system. And this is called the Millennium Scoop, building on the name from the 60s scoop after the residential school system led into a policy of taking kids away to be fostered and adopted out in the 60s. And so children who are removed, not necessarily even to residential schools, but to the foster care system or adopted out also experience elevated levels of violence, abuse and lifelong impacts, or in many cases, untimely death because that life is hard for them. And so remember that this is happening right now and planners are involved in it. And as Canadian citizens, we are implicated by our silence or we have the power to connect with our MPs, our MLAs, uh, and others to say that this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable and it is about time that we um, reconcile with Indigenous communities and foreground the well-being, especially of Indigenous children and families. I want to take a little bit of time to share with you the specific story of my community, the Guaslanacro Nations, to talk about how planning was used and how we're reclaiming planning. So I promise, I promise that we're building up to a bit of a hopeful ending um, and, and a call to action. Um, but just before we get there, just one more story. So this is uh, really, this story is how I got into Indigenous planning, um, knowing this history growing up. I shared with you earlier that picture of Ba'as, the village of the Nakoda people, my people, and how it was built according to that ethic of care with the most vulnerable people at the center. Well, in the 1950s, 1960s, um, you know, kind of at the height, the most oppressive period of the Indian Act and uh, a time when our people were being kept out of uh, the, the sort of general economy by um, virtue of racist policies around fishing licenses, around enfranchisement, land rights, all of those things. Our people were struggling out in their villages in Guasla and Nakoda territory to the south and asked their Indian agent, reached out to Indian Affairs for support in bringing some infrastructure, bringing support into the communities. And um, it's also important to note at this point that we were very, our villages are very isolated on the central coast. And so children were taken out of our community and sent to St. Michael's Residential School in Alert Bay out of Port McNeil. Uh, because we had no school in our area. And so in the 1960s, INA countered, or Indian Affairs countered, and said, look, if you, the Guasla Nakura amalgamate and move to Vancouver Island, closer to this town of Port Hardy, we will build a new reserve for you with electricity, with running water, we'll build a dock, we'll build a school so you don't have to send your kids out of community anymore. We will build you a big house so you can continue to practice your culture, governance and legal tradition. And um, we will build you a fully uh, functioning, beautiful modern community um, for you to stay if you'll just move and amalgamate. Now, Port Hardy is in Quaggit territory, so it's not even in our traditional territories. And of course, it's a big boat ride across the Queen Charlotte Strait to, to Dzokwadi, the site of this proposed new reserve. Uh, and so people went back and forth about it. But in the end, the idea in particular of having a school and community and not having to send kids to residential school anymore was one of the factors that convinced people to at least check it out. And so my ancestors, uh, around 200 of them at the time who were living in the villages said, okay, we'll go over and check it out. We'll pack up our boats with, you know, basics, some food and clothing and just our basics that we need. We'll go check out this new reserve and, um, and see if we feel like settling there. And so in 1964, a few boatloads of folks headed over across the Queen Charlotte Strait to this new reserve site of Zokwadi. Now, in the meantime, while these negotiations were happening, uh, Indian Affairs did their planning for this new reserve. And so they uh, took a look at a, a map and laid out 
lines for where the houses could go, the lot lines, and allocated a budget, I think of about 500,000 for all of the development that they were proposing for the site without ever ground truthing, without ever ground truthing. Uh, and so in the, the few weeks or months before people were set to arrive there, after the funds had been allocated, the lot lines had been laid, they sent out the first crews of people to prepare and do the building and create this community for my members to arrive to. And of course, when they showed up, A, several of the lot lines were literally in the river or on hillsides or just completely unbuildable. And B, they discovered that the whole reserve is a granite outcropping. And so almost the entire budget was used just for blasting for a couple of sites. So I'm going to share with you here a picture of the village in um, the 70s. These pictures were taken by Wilson Duff. And so what happened is that these boatloads of folks showed up to three or four unfinished houses. No electricity, uh, no running water. There was no dock. There was no school, no paved roads, um, no big house nothing except for these three or four unfinished houses. And you can see here how um, this is not the modern community that was promised. This was not this sort of modern ideal that my people agreed to move for. But by the time they got to Tzalkwadi, it was too late in the season to go back. And so they stayed. And there are many horror stories that come from my community of around this time. Um, I don't have a picture here, but because there was no dock and everyone arrived by boat, many, many of the boats washed up onto shore and were ruined. And so not only could people not take their boats home, but they couldn't continue to participate in fishing, commercial fishing, which was the main industry at the time because their boats were ruined. Not only that, but many people were actually living on those boats because there were so few houses built and prepared for them. And so many lives were lost as those big storms came in overnight and these boats broke open or were washed away. You can see here a picture of children. And so some children arrived to Tzalkwadi from St. Mike's to find that their houses were overcrowded and there was hardly anywhere for them to stay. People slept under the houses. It was horrible. And so you can imagine, once it was safe to travel again, or people went, no way, we're not staying here, we're going to head home. And when Indian Affairs heard about this desire to return back to the traditional territories, back to our homelands, they <laughs> went to our winter village sites and burned them down. So the beautiful village of Ba'as that you saw in the beginning, and the Guasla village of Takush, Indian agents went to those villages and burned them down. So our people were forced to stay here. So, so many lives were lost in that period that we went from around 200 to a population of 69 people. And our Indian agent at the time, Alan Fry wrote a book called How People Die, which was literally an extinction case study. You can find the book, How People Die. It took us 20 years to get running water well, next door was a town of like 10, 20,000 people in Port Hardy with a bustling mine. There was like a bay center across the bridge. I'm sharing this specific example because it is just incredible to me that a simple-ish planning error of insufficient funds and not ground truthing, just skipping that essential planning step could lead to near extinction for the Guasanacuado peoples. Now, of course, this is not the end of the story. I'm here and our community is here and our population is now over a thousand people. And I think planning has been the most, one of the most essential tools, I would say for us to climb out of those dark times. And my community members will say the same thing. And so I'm sharing a few pictures here and I wanna speak briefly to the role that planning has played in helping us escape this horrific normal that we had been put into by virtue of colonial policy and poor planning. What you see here is a picture on the far left. It's a picture of a yayuma or a play potlatch in my community from a few years ago. And so one of the first ways in which planning was used um, in a positive way was 
<laughs> I went to school in portables on reserve, but in the 90s, we got funding to build a brand new nice elementary school. And so for the first time in the history of sort of planning and architecture in our community, the whole community was involved in designing the school. And I've heard stories of those planning meetings where people got to say, we want a culture room. We want our artists artwork to be around this building to remind our kids of where they come from and who they are. We want beautiful classrooms with views outside. We want space for our community to come together. And we want this school to feel like a beautiful community hub. And so what came out was this building and, and it, it's funny to think that a building can transform the story of a community, but it really did. And I was in grade seven when we got this new school and the feeling of pride as we welcomed the first uh, set of basketball teams to a basketball tournament in our own gym, the feeling of pride as we gather together as community for Christmas concerts in our own school is indescribable. And the, that emotional, that feeling of pride, that feeling of hope really helped us turn the corner, I think. And now at the school, they do these play potlatches, these yaimas, where all of the kids learn all of the dances and all of the ceremony that we were banned from doing from the 1880s to the 1950s. They're now learning those things in school from beginning to end and doing play potlatches where the whole community shows up. And you can't see in this picture, but there's like three, 400 people in this gym watching this play potlatch. And so this school has become a site of, of healing, of community, of culture, of reclamation and planning was an important part of that. Comprehensive community planning was also critical for us. And so on the far right, you can see a picture of me and Elder Willie Wakis. Um, and one of our comprehensive community planning events. And if you're not familiar, I encourage you to just look it up, but CCP is like what OCPs wish they were. <laughs> it's long range holistic planning that is community driven. And so in 2008, this is how I got into indigenous planning, leading my community through a CCP process and learning how to do planning um, in the meantime. And so we did dozens of community meetings where we got together. And in those meetings, we processed the trauma of what had happened in the relocation. People shared stories of their residential school experiences. People shared stories of their time during the relocation. People shared stories of their family's loss and their own trauma in these planning meetings. And so when you hear Indigenous planners talk about, you know, needing to be trauma informed in our planning work, that's why, because it doesn't matter what the project is, these stories are going to come out anytime we get together and give them an outlet. And so we made space for that in our comprehensive community planning process, and it took us three years to get a final CCP, but by the end we had processed that trauma and grief together, we had healed relationships, and we had laid out our vision for the future and our goals and how we wanted to get there. And I think um, in the meantime, most of the things, so 2010 is when we finished that CCP, it's now 2021. In the last 11 years, we have been able to accomplish probably three quarters of the goals we set out for ourselves in 2010. We are economically flourishing, our, um, school, uh, our, our well-being. Many of our <clears throat> health programs have flourished. We have new programs in language reclamation. We have a community food garden. We have, <clears throat> pardon me, we have elders programs. We have culture programs that allow um, artists to reclaim our culture and make a living doing it. We're building a big house. We have a site laid out for a big house. We have um, good plans in place for taking over our own child and family uh, authority and, and trying to reduce the number of kids in care. And we have put docks in the homelands and have plans to rebuild their cabins out there at their original village sites. And so we're making moves towards reclaiming our place in our territories. The middle picture you can see here is a, a land use planning exercise we do. And so we do all our planning as a community because that is the most important way that planning can be reclaimed as a tool for Indigenous healing and well being rather than a tool for violence and oppression. Indigenous folks are 
self-determining, we have the inherent right to sovereignty, right? Like we do not need permission from the Canadian government to practice our governance, our self-governance, our legal systems. Uh, and we do not need permission to be out on our land. But we've been told for many centuries that we do. And so planning is becoming a really critical tool for our nations to take back our governance, to chart our own path forward, to reclaim our lands and our stewardship obligations. And change the story about what is normal back to something that nurtures our well-being and brings us back into reciprocal relationship with the land. And so I wanted to share the story of my community to show that that journey, I guess, from our ancestors use of, as Copper Joe Jack said this morning, you know, planning for our village sites, planning for good relationship with the land to this horrific period of having that planning power taken away from us and placed in the hands of others. And how now slowly we are reclaiming planning, reclaiming our power and authority. And as a result are experiencing healing and experiencing well-being and pride and hope for the future. I have to give a shout out here for my own mother, Colleen Hempel, who um, actually I'm gonna just show you a picture of her, who's been our, our uh, treaty negotiator for over a decade now, um, who recognized early on that the way for our people to get out of those dark times was to reclaim our self-determination and reclaim our title. And so my whole life, my idea of normal is that our people would return to our homelands and continue to exercise our stewardship obligations. I know that's not the case for everyone. And so if you take anything away from my keynote today, I want it to be this. Remember that Indigenous peoples are not seeking permission from the government to manage our own affairs. We already have the inherent right to self-govern. We are not seeking permission to use our own lands. Treaties are not lease agreements granted to First Nations by the government, but the other way around. There are lease agreements for colonial governments to use the land. And in the meantime, the rent is long overdue. And so I know this is probably contrary to what many of you believe. I know many of you do your planning in a way that encourages First Nations um, engagement and inclusion and you know, First Nations representation in our, our groups and in our sort of colonial institutions. We wanna see more indigenous people in provincial territorial government, in federal government, I know many of you have excellent intentions when you speak about these positive things, and yes, they are important. But at the end of the day, a colonial system is a colonial system. And as I mentioned earlier, it's founded on that idea of normal as white, capitalist, Christian, hetero, patriarchal. And until we are able to find entirely new ways of governing and being in relationship with the land, that legacy persists. I really wanna acknowledge Planning Institute of BC for the good work that you've been doing. The Canadian Institute of Planners has been doing good work in moving towards reconciliation and reckoning with the colonial past. But if there's one thing you take away from my keynote today, I want it to be that there is <laughs> nothing you can do that would support indigenous well-being more than to get out of our way and support indigenous self-determination and reclamation of land title. And so my sort of final challenge to you today is to think about what would change in your personal and professional life if you were to normalize indigenous sovereignty and title. I'm gonna share this picture here with you. Um, oops, is that? This is a picture of my mom. Colleen and my nephew Aliwas. I mentioned earlier that he's three years old. This picture is a little bit old, but this is a picture of my mom and Aliwas out in Ba'as, in the cabin that's out there just a, a year or so ago at an Easter, or two years ago, I guess, on an Easter trip. And so I want you to imagine a world where it's normal for multiple generations, three or more generations to know that our kids are safe and that we can hold them in our arms whenever we or they need it and where we can spend time out in our homelands because it nourishes us. 
And I want you to think about how beautiful your own life could be if it were more normal that Indigenous folks were in charge stewarding the lands for the benefit of all of us and building communities according to an ethic of care and seeking collective approaches to planning that were accessible and inclusive for everyone. I hope you will agree that what has been normal is no longer good enough. And if we are to live in good relationship between settlers, Indigenous, and others who suffer, um, including, um, you know, two-spirit queer folks out there, uh, Black folks, our um, other communities, Muslim folks who are also feeling the pain, the violence of these colonial, these racist systems, what would it look like to fundamentally shift our normal to recognize that these systems no longer serve us, these colonial systems. I know that it could be uncomfortable, but I think that discomfort is what's required as we adjust to a new normal that is just as happy and healthy for Indigenous folks as it is for settlers and has, has been. Um, and I think that discomfort is worth it. So I uh, just wanna thank you so much for listening to me today. And um, I really hope that the rest of the conference is lovely. And I hope that the next time we gather together, we are all working towards normalizing Indigenous sovereignty, Indigenous land title, and making sure that Indigenous babies can be in the arms of the people that love them. Um, and our communities will be much better as a result. So Gila Kisla, it's been an honor to be with you today. Jesse, for your powerful and important presentation. As a settler planner, you've given me lots to think about. Um, I appreciate the stories that you shared, the heartbreaking ones, and your hope for the future. Um, hopefully, you know, we can all become more thoughtful and aware as people and as planners. So um, thank you, Gwyneth Jish Masicho, for, for that.